to invest. Our guys were up there last week. It is incredible the stuff that they're doing. Not an ETS, but by regulation, literally just closing small companies down to the big emitters. So a different approach, but same, same outcome. And it sort of leaves you with this one last point, and that is this. Let's argue just for a moment, because probably none of us will be here in any great magnitude to see this side of maybe a sort of timetable that tell us all the stuff we're having now, maybe maybe it's 50 years from now. But let's just imagine I'm right for a moment. Let's just imagine for a moment that climate change is real and it has an impact on catastrophic weather conditions. By the way, nothing I said this to Don Nessie will hold you to it, I'm right. Nothing New Zealand can do will make a difference. I accept that, because we're 0.2% of world emissions. So it doesn't matter how much we change, that's not enough to change the world, it won't be. But this is the difference, and that is that unless China, unless India, unless the United States are actively engaged in trying to change the carbon footprint, the world won't make any difference, because everything they do dwarfs us. But if every country does something, will it make a difference? And the answer is, on the advice we've had, yes, but it depends how much they do. So, if we don't do it, and if we don't all get engaged, and if you know those of you who don't believe we should do something are, are wrong, and I'm right, just tell me who's going to be affected. Because I'll tell you the answer. Your kids and your grandkids. And virtually nobody else in New Zealand. Because if catastrophic weather patterns happen, um, the people that are affected are farmers. You're the most affected by trade access, and you're the most affected by, by the weather patterns. And you know, like I know, there have been suicides in Northland because of the droughts. And you know, like I know, there have been suicides in Australia because of the droughts. And I'm not arguing that the climate change, I just don't know. But if the world weather alters to that level, it's catastrophic then in the end, that's what we're affected. Not the urban consumer in Parnell and Auckland, the farmer. So then I could say to you, well, I'll tell you what, I'll do your deal. You're out. I'll take you out of climate change, I'll refund any costs that you have, any minor costs that we implement on you, on one condition. You agree to sign in writing, you'll never come back to the government and ask for support, it all goes to custody. And I reckon most of you would sign. I've got one right. Because would you really take that insurance policy? See, we pay in hundreds of millions of dollars a year to the Earthquake and War Damage Commission. Not because you think there's going to be an earthquake in your house tomorrow, but because you can't take the risk. So, we're not mad, and we're certainly not zealots. And we don't want to leave the world, and we certainly want you to succeed. And in the end, as I say to my caucus, who sometimes disagree with me, you'll be surprised to know, or maybe not surprised to know, in opposition you can pick and choose your fights, in government you can't. Sometimes they're easy, and sometimes they're not. Um, I think in this one, we've done the best we can. Um, in the end, if you vote a Labour government, it'll be twice as expensive on day one, and probably 10 times more expensive in day 35 or whatever, or years into the future. And I think if you put it on balance on everything else we're doing, that's the strategy. But we support you, and um, we want you to be successful. Um, we can't convince you we're right, because then you've got to make your own call. But the single biggest group I worry about is the future farmers of New Zealand. And I think you should worry about them too. Thanks very much. Some Roman mics in the room. I um, just put your hand up, I'll stand. So, who's first? Peter. Yes, I've got the mic. Peter Adamski, Karen Um Next week, um, there's a consent hearing taking place in um, Karen Anki on the uh, irrigation water. Um, the farm has done all appropriate uh, procedures and the, um, you've received um, help, um, everything he requires from all farms around and also the iwi. 
The last paragraph of the Iwi statement asks for um, payment for, for water. So my question lies around what is the government's current or future policy on ownership of water? Yeah, so we believe the Crown owns water, um, and there is there's certainly going to be a debate about water allocation rates, and that's what the Land and Water Forum are looking at. And I think over time, I don't know how long, because it's a very complex issue, but I can see a day where there'll be tradable water rights, and I think that'll actually make sense, because that will mean that somebody who can use that water more efficiently will be prepared to buy those rights, and someone that can save more water will be prepared to save water and sell their rights. But our view is the Crown owns water, um, and I think we should get to an efficient allocation of that water, because at the moment we've got a first and first serve basis, and it's not always efficient. And also, that would help us in terms of uh, paying for water irrigation schemes, but it's our view that the Crown owns it. <coughs> Um, Prime Minister, uh, I, I'd like to first commend you on um, the, the spending, um, the increase in R&D spending that you, you've put in the budget. Um, and also, I, I agree with your view that uh, if they're going to do anything about climate change, it's going to come through science. Yeah. Given that, uh, that you are uh, focused on, on, on science and science and agriculture, but also science and manufacturing and, and elsewhere, um, if we look forward to uh, 2025, what do you uh, see as the main, will, will be the main drivers of the economy then? Yeah, look, I tell you, it's a very interesting question. If you look at, it's very difficult when you compare one country to another, but if you look at the composition of exports in New Zealand versus the composition of exports out of Denmark, they're kind of slightly similar countries in a funny kind of way, you know, they're similar sort of size, they've got a number of different factors. Denmark's exports are hugely diversified, and New Zealand's are not. They're fundamentally around commodity-based uh, agriculture, really, <laughs> and, and to a certain degree, tourism and the So what I reckon is going to happen in New Zealand is I think all of the food production areas are going to increase, but, but what is certainly going to increase is going to be the value-added components of that, right through the hopefully nutraceuticals and the pharmaceutical-type sector. And the second thing I think is going to happen is I think the internet is going to open up a huge wealth of opportunities around the services sector for New Zealand. Because for the first time in our life through the internet, we can actually contact a vast audience at no cost. So one of the guys who's the first investor in Facebook actually has decided to come and live in New Zealand. He's here for about half the year now. He's still on the board of Facebook. So he was telling me at the moment they have 500 million users of Facebook. Um, they'll have 630 million by the end of the year and a billion by next year. So you think about that capability to run services um, and to operate. Uh, some of you guys might know this, but the, the number one, um, the largest meat processing plant in the world is a mecca. Right? Okay? It was actually designed by New Zealanders. Now, to tell you the interesting thing about it, you can only go to mecca in Saudi Arabia if you're Muslim. And these guys weren't. And they designed it over the internet, they administered the building of it and the whole nine yards with them over the internet. It's a service based industry um, basically out of New Zealand. So I think the composition is going to change to high tech manufacturing, high tech and, and service based industries. You know, London law firms having their sister firm in New Zealand type of argument, uh, right through to the, you know, food manufacturing uh, and, uh, and the likes. And, and as you can see in some areas, we, and, and also the resource sector is potentially extremely large. So at the moment we make $3 billion a year out of oil and gas, like 10 to 12 or something like that. Thank you, Prime Minister, for for a uh, full and frank uh, conversation with us. You want my pen, don't you, Lock? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. yes. I don't feel it coming. I've got one. I've got the pen. I've got the pen. I've got the pen here. I just need paper for you. Um, you said you, you made a couple of comments in there. Can we produce enough food? Um, and then you also highlighted the risk of subsidies in Canada and and the huge distortion that they have. And yet, we are going to give we're giving subsidy to forestry. And have you done some work uh, around the risk to, to our economy of that huge distortion of giving subsidies to forestry? Yeah, so the, uh, in, in the end, I mean, the argument about putting a price on carbon is, is really, and the reason why we prefer a carbon 
um, market or emissions trading scheme as opposed to a carbon tax. Because a carbon tax is technically an extremely blunt instrument. Um, notwithstanding what we've got at the moment is a capped price of carbon and it has similarity to carbon tax, but technically as a price over time, an ETS is better because it is effectively saying we want you to do less of the things we don't want and more of the things you do want. And what we've looked at and said is, look, if half of all of our emissions come from agriculture, um, the fastest way to get on top of that is actually not to beat you guys over the head with, with a big piece of wood. It's basically give you the technology to be able to resolve those issues. And we don't have that yet, but we've got to invest in that to get there. And I actually don't think, that's why I personally don't think, it will be as big an issue as a lot of people think, because I don't think the reduction in New Zealand's emissions profile will be linear. In other words, I don't think it will be a straight line that just goes through. I think we'll find some solutions and there will be dramatic changes at periods of time. But in the short term, the fastest thing we can do is suck that carbon out of the atmosphere uh, from New Zealand's point of view is grow trees. And it's not a bad thing because we've got about a million hectares of erosion prone land. So for us, we just simply try and get that change of balance. Um, you know, is it the right thing to do? I don't think it's a bad thing to do from New Zealand's point of view. But over time, I'm, I'm of the technology with the best solution we have. Well, it has, a, it has an impact, but um, it's true in a lot of, of different places. Um, it's also true of saying, okay, like in Australia, um, there is going to be a negative cost, if you like, on fossil fuel based gener the electricity generation. And in fact, in New Zealand, one of the interesting things about the ETS is of all of the applications we've had for new power generation to come on stream, uh, none of them actually have been from fossil fuels yet. They're all coming from renewables, as they consider if that's still the way to go, because they're all water, <coughs> thermal, and, and wind. Yes, Prime Minister, uh, Tom Hinton from <coughs> South Canterbury. Uh, I would uh, really commend you on your efforts with ECAN having been involved for uh, all of those 19 years that it <laughs> um, And say, so, well done. Uh, we've got to make sure that we go from here constructively on that path. Uh, what, what I'd like to ask, a couple of points. Uh, in the, uh, a lot of us are not denying there's been changes, and particularly if they're as old as I am, they've seen changes in the weather pattern over the years. But, but in fact, my first question would be, why is only uh, the EU and New Zealand actually got an ETS? And how, why do you uh, measure the ETS, the carbon footprint, by per head of population? Because the fastest way we could halve that is bring in four million people from somewhere else. Yeah. And I think that's a nonsense. It must be able to be measured some other way. But thank you, sir. Yeah, so in terms of our, our cost, our cost doesn't come from people per capita cost, it comes from our tonnage of greenhouse gases. So yeah, one of the things that's been actually driving the problem in New Zealand is, believe it or not, we've had the fastest population growth 